welcome to another edition of Abolitionist Abstractions. As always, we're covered by BIPCAT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCAT.org. So I am back, and this week I have another guest with me. This is the new theme of this year. And this week I am joined by Ben Stone, better known to a lot of people as the Bad Quaker. Hey, Ben. How you doing, man? Hey, good to talk to you again. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a while. We uh, we, we converse uh, quasi-regularly through Telegram and stuff like that. But yeah, it's been a while since we've actually got to sit down and have a chat. So I was, uh, I was rather excited after I put that one episode out and I heard from a bunch of people, including you. And, you know, you were like, hey, if you want to sit down, we could do this. And I said, great, let's do it. Of course, I was, <laughs> also wanted to try to get you on my other show, but I understand, you know, for reasons why a lot of people don't want to do my other show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm doing this show, so I get to talk to more people. So, yeah, so last time I, I think I talked to you on a podcast was probably probably had to do with Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, the book that you're uh, loosely connected to. <laughs> 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 and the... There's there's been some recent news. I was telling you this before we started recording that, you know, the the stuff that's happened recently with Adam Kokesh, who I'm pretty sure, as, as far as I remember, you and I come from the same position on that. Not really a big fan of his, at least anymore, <laughs> uh, for right. the for the for the antics he uh, participates in and his basically his whole attitude to the liberty approach these days. And you know, for the for those who aren't aware, I'm sure I'm sure most people who listen to the show are. You know, recently Adam was arrested again, and he made a whole bunch of wild claims. You know, ranging from this was an attack on him because he had just filed for for running for president in 2020, which of course Steve Miller Miller was kind enough to go dig up the information and find <laughs> out that oh no, actually Adam filed officially on December 1st of 2017. So whatever he was actually doing that day, it definitely wasn't filing to become the president of the United States. And then he got busted <laughs> with, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I never found out the specifics, but I, I heard told, at least the, the, the way the, the police put it, it was somewhere between over an ounce and under five ounces of cannabis, which of course Adam claimed wasn't his. Uh, I heard you know rumblings that they were trying to claim it was a setup and whatnot, but through all this, I've talked enough about this. I mean, we did an entire Lulberts episode about this where I think we pretty much well, pretty well smacked down all of Adam's BS. <laughs> uh, but the larger issue that came out of this was there was lots of claims that what Adam was trying to engage in is civil disobedience. And that struck a nerve with me because, well, thanks to you, Ben, <laughs> I have an issue with the term civil disobedience, which started way back the first time I came across your... Series, your series from the Bad Quaker podcast entitled uh, Beyond Civil Disobedience. And I've mentioned this multiple times. To this day, it's still the only podcast, the entire series, actually, that I keep on my phone at all times. Like, I listen to podcasts constantly. Daily, I listen to hours and hours worth of podcasts. But those are the only five that I keep stored specifically so that I can listen to Usually about once a year or so, I throw it on <laughs> uh, just to kind of remind myself of where I was, you know, where I came from, where I was when I found that series and where I am now. And uh, so that whole greater idea, like I, I've, I've put it as I see a difference. Uh, I, I think civil disobedience is BS. I think it's something it's still begging. The, it's still essentially begging the government to actually follow its own rules. Where I see a yeah. difference, I engage in what I call non-compliance, because to me, civil disobedience is an act where you're willing to get arrested, like you're willing to suffer the consequences for your cause per se, whatever your cause is, uh, in hopes that things will get changed, which is still begging the the, the masters, in my opinion. Whereas non-compliance is you go out and do what you want to do as long as you're not harming another person or their property, you know, aggressing against them with no intention of getting arrested. <laughs> and getting arrested is a bad thing. It's not to say, oh, look, now I can draw attention to myself. It's like, no, no, this is not what I want to happen. But I got that from reading and listening to you. So what are your thoughts on this whole civil disobedience aspect of uh, activism, I guess, that people try to still engage in? I appreciate what you said there. Um, yeah, that that is very accurate to my belief. I went through 
I don't have the, the the stuff in front of me right now. It is in that the reference references are in that podcast series that you mentioned. But I went through and found out the proper legal definition of civil disobedience, and it is it, it states right in the proper legal definition of it. And I'm not talking about the Wikipedia or the Webster's version, but if you go to an actual law dictionary and you read the actual meaning of this. And uh, I believe it was revised the last time, like in the early 80s or something like that. But it specifically states that civil disobedience is not disobedience to the state or to the, you know, to the idea of being governed or to the idea of law. It is disobedience to a specific law or policy with the purpose of changing that law or policy. So... You're not fighting the government, you're not fighting the state, you're not fighting uh, any of the real oppression that we face. All you're fighting is the one particular law or rule or whatever that you've picked out. And if you take some of the greatest examples of civil disobedience, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, just pick out one that you can think of, or two, and you say, well, what was the ultimate end of all of their misery, all of they went through, all of what they went through in the case of Martin Luther King, his death uh, in a very dramatic way before he even could see the light of what was going to, you know, whether or not he was going to win. And you look at all these, and they don't accomplish what what they want to accomplish. In the case of Gandhi, yeah, he got he helped to get rid of it, British rule. But then there's local Indian rule, which was just as bad and worse in many ways uh, than the British rule, because at least the British kind of followed their own rules. The, the Indian government is about as corrupt a government as exists anywhere in the world. So, oh, but he, you know what he did do? He embedded his own family into government leadership. Whoopee, hey, good job. You know, that's the opposite of what an anarchist should be working towards. And poor Martin Luther King Jr., you know, is just murdered like that. And the guy who like held him as he's, as he took his last breath, Jesse Jackson turns into be a complete sellout to the state and, you know, almost like a joke. And what really came of that? Well, I don't know. There's still, you know, there's still KKK people marching around all over the South and there's still uh, oppression against black people in America. So, so what did you really accomplish? Well, you made a lot of noise for a while. You got a few laws changed, but we're pretty much all same in the same condition that we were in. You know, well, oh, the the cops are not sicking dogs on people like there's you know famous pictures of that uh, from the marches in the south. No, they just pull you over and shoot you because you didn't reach for your wallet in the correct way. Yeah. So that accomplished a lot. Wow. Yeah. That well, was worth <laughs> that was worth having King shot and you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, yeah, they're not, they're, they're no longer sicking dogs on you. They're shooting your dogs instead. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if I like that trade off. I've had to fight off dogs in a dog fight before, and I'd like to think I could handle myself a lot better than a cop shooting my dog. That would actually probably affect me even worse. So, yeah, I agree. It's. It, and it's and it, these are things that people don't like to hear either. You know, especially when it comes to instances like. Martin Luther King or Gandhi that so many people think highly of, you know, the same thing was the same thing was said for so long of Nelson Mandela, everybody. Oh, he's such a champion. It's like, no, look what he did after the fact. Once he was in power, it's like, no, no, these things always end up backfiring. It's the same reason that I believe any type of attempt at a, a violent revolution is is not an actual step towards freedom and even even and, and again this is something that I, I kind of picked up originally through through some of your writings and after mulling it over for a long time I actually came to the realization uh, secession is the same type of thing all of these different acts that you're taking like that people think they're taking to you know oh, I'm taking a step towards freedom I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to lessen the power of the state well yeah on paper it sounds that way but Look at the historical examples. You know, one of the greatest, one of the, you know, when it comes to secession specifically, one of the greatest examples in history is the USSA. And look how much worse it is in 200 years afterwards. But people just keep trying because they, they get the white, they get the whitewashed version of history. 
You know, yeah. I never, I never knew the backstory. I never knew the backstory and what else went on with people like Mandela or even Gandhi. Like, you know, you said after the fact, yeah, he embedded his family. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, we'll take advantage of this situation. We're not, we, we, we gained a claim. We, we brought attention to this, but nothing really changed. And okay, well, since nothing changed, I might as well become a part of it. You know, <laughs> if you can't beat him, join him, I guess. Speaking of embedding members of your family deep into government where they can stay for the rest of their lives, Ron Paul, cough, cough, Ron Paul, cough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another one. One of, the, one of the most sacred of cows, especially in our circles. You never, <laughs> you never attack Raw Paul. Oh, gosh, we've got, uh, we've got so much flack in the past for that. We did, we, did an, we, did, we did an entire episode of The Seeds of Liberty with Luffy and entitled Slaying Sacred Pauls. And it was the you know oh, the, wow. the picture the picture was a uh, you know was pictures of, of Ron and Rand with like slashes through their face so it was very obvious of who we were talking about and we did almost like a three hour <laughs> episode about that just bashing the heck out of the fact that yeah great guy you know I met him sweetheart of a guy super gracious very nice you know smart guy um, but he still tried to play the game and you know he kind of realized after a point. Yeah, there's not much else I could do, so I'll get out. But my son's still there, and I'm sure more. I'm sure more Pauls will make it in there eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And his grandson-in-law was the uh, uh, Mitch McConnell's after after being his campaign manager, after being Ron Paul's campaign manager, and then being Rand Paul's campaign manager. He went on to be um, uh, who did I just say? Mitch McConnell's campaign manager until. Finally, he was convicted of uh, a situation with when he was Ron Paul's campaign manager in 2012. He and like four other of Ron Paul's top people got into a bribery scam where they gave some guy $73,000 to switch his uh, public endorsement over to Ron Paul days before the primary. And so he finally, that finally caught up with uh, Ron Paul's campaign manager. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, I think but I remember hey, that. He, it, it couldn't possibly be Ron Paul's fault. He wouldn't know what his staff was doing, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's one of those things. Like I said, I mean, I I used to love the guy, although I wasn't I wasn't a big, well, I wasn't a Paul bot like so many of my friends were because I I came in right. late, I came in late to the game, so I kind of missed like I came in after the 2012 election, so I kind of missed all of it. I I was actually introduced to Ron Paul through Tom Woods. Most people did it the reverse. Most people heard about Ron Paul and <laughs> learned about Tom Woods. No, I found Tom Woods' stuff, and I was like, oh, this guy's interesting. And then he's he and he introduced me to it. But but yeah, it's even if he you know even if he was completely innocent uh dr paul in all of these situations you know if after they happen so many times it's like well yeah maybe you're not being as careful as you should be but in either case you're still <laughs> you're still trying to put you're still trying to play the game and you know i did, did he expose more people to these ideas yeah sure did it do that much good yeah i mean i i think unfortunately i think it's still a little too early to tell that because yeah there are i mean i have come across a lot of people younger than me that you know the generation below mine now that have these ideas that they blow me away because i'm like wow at your age i had no clue about any of this i wasn't even thinking about these things <laughs> you know so it's possible another another, uh, another decade or so maybe more of these people will be uh fully uh, more more fully integrated into into society and making more of a difference but overall i still think that the playing the political games in any sense whether it be playing an actual politics or attempting to change the system through civil disobedience or secession it just like i said the track record just not that good <laughs> yeah yeah one of the things people will jump on with secession is well they'll say something like uh uh, well, you'll admit, won't you, that a smaller government is better, is easier to control than a bigger government? Well, a smaller rapist is easier to control than a bigger rapist. But do you do you really want to control a rapist? Why don't we just get rid of the rapist? <laughs> you know, a, a a bigger thief is greater threat than a smaller thief. But you're getting stolen from either way. And also, you know, I mean, that's on the that's on the like the philosophical view of it. But the practical end is. If you have ever tried to work with a city government, uh, a real, just a real basic example, when I was like 17, 18 years old, I was in constant trouble with the local police. And part of it was my fault to start with, 
uh, in the sense that I was in a, um, uh, a park in, in town and I had beer that, you know, I had worked in the hot summer to, to earn the money to buy a six pack of beer. And I'm with a couple friends in the park and the cops walk up on us and they grab the beers and pour them all out on the ground and act like they're doing us a favor. And I was kind of a smart aleck jerk with the guy because I worked hard for that money and that was my beer. And I'm not hurting anybody. I don't care if I'm not the magic age. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not even drunk. And, uh, and they didn't like that too much. And then I got into a little scuffle a couple weeks later with them where they decided they were going to pull me over uh, for, <laughs> for uh, pulling a donut in the middle of an intersection in my Mustang. <laughs> and, and so they were going to pull me over for that, and I just decided they weren't going to. So I took off and basically ran off and left them because my, I had a 66 Mustang that I had done a lot of work on. And it would, under the, right, under the right circumstances, it would slightly raise the front wheels off the ground. So, um, so I just ran off and left them, you know. And from that point on, they actively looked for reasons to pull me over. I can't and, imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> and it went back, you know, the other way, too. Like, I would, uh, it was a small town in California, and I would pull up in front of the police station and just light up the rear tires, but I knew I would be what far away before they could do anything about it. In California, there's a, a law that says for any traffic violation, the where the where there are no injuries, the uh, the officer has to keep a line of a line of sight with the vehicle at all times, um, in order to give the citation. Or that's the way it was in in the 70s to prevent high speed uh, chases. I'm assuming. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, so, so I could outrun anything around, so I knew that. So I would just, you know, do things like that because I, I figured the cops started it. Uh, so I would do these kind of things. I would also go, and the statute of limitations has run out, so I can say this. I would go over to the police cars and just snap the antennas off with wire cutters, you know. And, and I would do stuff like that. I would do that in the middle of the night when they weren't around and didn't know who was doing it. But they probably had a pretty good idea. So they would do things like um, they would follow my car and they would follow me around town and they would stop me. They would measure the height off the ground. They would measure the depth of the tire tread. They would have me sound the horn, turn on the blinkers. You know, we would do all this ridiculous stuff. Mostly they would just wanted to sniff around, see if they could smell anything. And so I complained about this to my parents, you know, that, that I'm not getting pulled over because I'm doing anything. I'm getting pulled over because they're harassing me. Of course, I'm an innocent child. How could <laughs> I possibly be blamed for this? Yeah. You know? And so my mom didn't believe me. My dad didn't believe me. But one day my mom borrowed my car for her and my sister to go across town for. And they got followed and harassed by the cops. And it really upset my mom because now it tells my mom that I was telling the truth the whole time which I wasn't, but <laughs> so she, she need to know that. Went, yeah. So she went straight to the mayor's office and started talking to the mayor about it because it's a little town, you know, and he basically told her, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. We've got a good thing going here. Go back to minding your own business. And so she began a campaign to get him kicked out. And one of the other ladies within her, you know, social circle, uh, elected as, as, uh, mayor of the town instead of him and she fought really hard for a good year to get her favorite person picked as mayor and what ended up happening over that was the lady that she got elected as mayor put in less than one term resigned and moved away from town the the person that 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 mayor that my mom's friends that became mayor the person that mayor hired as city controller and fired the last city controller because once they got in there, they saw how corrupt this local city was, and they started cleaning house on this stuff. Well, the, the city controller was in there about six months, and his son got kidnapped, and he got a call that said, move yourself and all your belongings out of California City was the name, California City, California. Move your, your family and all your belongings out of town or you'll never see your son again. And, and so he did it. I mean, he just sold everything, and wow. they let go of his son. I mean, this was this was nasty. And it turned out later we found out, oh, so the mayor resigned, 
and the and there was a special election and the old mayor ran and <laughs> what do you know the old mayor got reelected how convenient um yeah <laughs> my, my uh my dad had a 10 acre, 10 acre ranch outside it in the in the middle of the desert uh, where I'd spent quite a bit of time living out there. It had no electricity. It had no telephone. It had its own well. It had its own generators. It was pretty much self, you know, self-sufficient. Eventually, that 10-acre ranch was purchased by somebody with cash. They literally showed up at the bank with grocery bags full of cash. Wow. And we didn't make the connection right away, but eventually this whole operation was busted and they had a big greenhouse and they bought my dad's ranch as a drying facility because it had a big ranch house in it that had really big rooms and it was way out in the desert where nobody would see it so they would use trucks to haul a pot out there and dry the pot that they had grown in in their uh, greenhouses all using hydroponics and everything so when that whole thing was busted then we found out that that the local police basically were covering for that whole operation and were in on it the whole time. And that's why they, they, that's why they had to control the mayor. That's why they had to control, you know, who was the, the head of the city council and, and who was elected to the city council and who was the, the controller and who was the police, chief of police and all this. The whole thing was corrupt from one end to the other. And nobody would have guessed this. It was a quiet little California town in the middle of the desert that nobody's ever heard of. And, you know, it, 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 there was no industry there of any real uh, kind, you know. But that's the level of corruption, whether you see it or not. It's, it's like in almost every town. The, the little town that I live in here in Ohio, there was a scandal a few years back. A guy uh, that ran the, the donut shop, the local donut shop, decided he would run for mayor. And the next thing you know, there's an investigation. He's busted with cocaine. And so he has to drop out of the run for mayor. And then right before it's getting ready to, to go to trial, the prosecutor drops all the charges. And they say, well, there wasn't enough evidence, so everything's dropped. The whole thing was to keep that guy from beating the, the mayor in the local election. Now, that's the two cities that I've had something, something to do, you know, where I've actually seen up close what was going on in the city, in City Hall. Both tiny little towns, and yet that level of corruption in both towns. So I have to assume that it's that way in pretty much every single little town. So if we can't control what happens in a tiny little town with a few thousand residents, if government corrupts on that level, then your secession is not going to help. I'm, I'm sorry to the people of Catalonia. I'm sorry to the people in New Hampshire or Texas or Alaska or California or Vermont. Secession's not going to help. It doesn't matter how little you get the monster. It's still a monster. Yeah, that that is kind of historically proven. That's the thing. People people want to. I I understand the idea of it. People want looking for some kind of hope. You know, I used to be one of these people. I used to promote se secession openly. I mean, heck, I still have a Facebook page that we started a long time ago, kind of as a joke. But some people took it seriously for a while. That was I. I tried to start my own church and titled it the Church of the Immaculate Secession. <laughs> and you know it was it was reading it was reading your thoughts on this originally that got me thinking about it and then i started going back and looking at more of the historical examples and i'm like yeah this this does, just doesn't add up it's one of these things that in theory it sounds great but when you look how it plays out time and time again it doesn't work and you know, I've I've spoken about this before, but I, I un totally understand that small town mentality that you're talking about where most people would, you know, it's, it's unassuming of most people would say, oh, there can't possibly be, you know, crazy corruption going on here. Oh, no, it, it usually is. I mean, I that's the whole reason that I eventually started calling myself an anarchist and just gave up on the system altogether was trying to run for local office here in Nassau County and seeing just <laughs> once once I got just I didn't even get on the inside because I never actually made it there but just getting that close to actually see the level of corruption and the level of outright collusion between the two parties to keep anybody out and it was they would focus their attention on what would seemingly be little nobodies, you know, some some random 
small business owner in one particular town who had a bug up his butt about something. And you would think, oh, this guy's not nobody. We already have like established Democrat and, and Republicans running in this district. So there's nothing to worry about. But they would specifically focus their attention and all of their money and efforts on these people because these were the people who actually were trying to bring up real issues that would alter what these what these folks who were already in power had going on, like what you're describing. So yeah, absolutely. They have to they have to maintain that that power because there's always one group within the government in, in in a particular area that ends up having more power over the other you know and sometimes it's the sometimes it's the police department sometimes it's the actual mayor's office i've seen it play out both ways but whoever yeah. it is they always want to keep everything under control and they they will do anything in their power and, mo- and like i said most people are just so oblivious to it because they go oh no oh sure you know federal politics is messed up but yeah local level and you know, I used to think that way, but it just it doesn't seem to play out. And I've tried to explain this to all the people I know who are very big on whether they actually use terms like secession still uh, or not. But they talk about, especially the ones who who love to talk about their covenant communities they want to set up everywhere. It's like, you know, their their, their plans, including my buddy Dave, who uh, has some wacky plans, including this. But it's you know, t- still taking over a town and doing like actually getting like what you were talking about. Your your you know your mom tried to do put put a mayor in charge so you can do that. It's like. Even if you manage to get to the power center, like if you manage to get elected to the whatever the actual power center in that town is, if you manage to take that over, please show me the historical example where the people who got into that position did not become power hungry afterwards and make yeah. the thing much, much worse. It just never plays out that way. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I was thinking of the, uh, remember the guy with the bulldozer? I think it was either Colorado or Killdozer, Utah. yes. Killdozer, yeah. <laughs> and then the guy in New Hampshire with, or maybe it was Vermont, with the tractor that was running over the police cars with a tractor. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, uh... that, That's what local politics will do to your brain. They will just get you so angry that you, I mean, that was just suicide for those guys to do that, but, you know. Yeah, well, I mean... I, I, I remember specifically in the case of the of the killdozer guy, I think that was his kind of point. <laughs> he, he didn't yeah. play, he didn't plan on walking away from that. <laughs> Although he, yeah. he he also didn't plan on I think it was the tranny that I don't remember if it was the tranny or something broke halfway through and he wasn't planning on that happening either. <laughs> yeah. Um, he but, wasn't really done with his destruction. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, it does. It'll it'll drive you insane. And that's why I it's it's it it sucks because I've I've tried to in the past year or so, I've tried to take a step back and, and try to have more empathy for people and ideas that I've kind of rejected in the past because I came to that. I finally came to that realization that I, I really don't know much of anything. And uh, was that Socrates? Was that the Socrates quote? You know, that's the first step in, into wisdom or whatever is re- recognizing you don't know anything. But it's it's really hard for me. Like every time I want to have sympathies for the people that are trying to do things through the public means, it's just like, or they or they come to me and say, "Hey, look, we got this done and it's successful." It's like, yeah, but at what cost? You know, number yeah. one, you've just you've you've furthered the system. You haven't really lessened it in any way. You know, even even the people who are who are championing all the you know all the so called tax cuts that we just received. It's like, yeah, look around. What's that? 30% tariffs on solar panels and other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'll cut the taxes in one way, but they're going to they're going to boost it up in another. That's why I I think it's just it's it's a, it t- it's continuously a fruitless endeavor that unfortunately too many people, good people that I know, keep getting sucked into cuz they keep wanting to to try cuz you have to do something. And even isn't isn't just a little bit less tyranny uh, preferable? Again, yes, but at what cost? Because you know, or or even is it even is it even sorry rather less tyranny? Because even if you remove some tyranny in one area, what is it being replaced in another area? I, I just don't understand how so many people that I've come to know over the past five plus years or so that I consider rather intelligent. <laughs> And I've had many a conversation with, uh, uh, on on a high level, as far as I'm concerned, can just like blatantly reject the history 
of what goes on. And may, and maybe, I don't know, th- I've thought this many a time, maybe it's just because I'm one of the few people, at least the ones that I, in the circles that I personally travel in, who came to this whole idea, these ideas of freedom and, 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 and like actual freedom, not the, the USA version. But I came to this through history, where most of my friends came to this through the study of economics. Yeah, and, and I guess maybe that's the the advantage I have is because I got here by being a constitutional conservative and then being pre- presented information and going, "Hey, this doesn't line up with what I remember," and then going back and studying everything <laughs> all over again and going, "Hey, they lied to us about everything. This is all bullshit." Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's it. <laughs> Literally I don't everything. Yeah, it really is it's so bad. I mean, I hate to say that because you know, I usually when people when ma- people make that claims about, you know, especially when people make those claims about the governments, especially the more the really conspiracy minded ones, I often have to remind them that you know that is a, that is a fallacious way of thinking. That's not necessary. You know, the government did it, and therefore it must be bad. But okay, realistically, they really did lie about a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> but you know, they do uh, they do the trick where they you get too mad, you get too upset that they took your you know your batch of bananas so they'll give you one of the ba- bananas back but they'll take all your lemons and then you get upset because they took all your lemons and they'll give you one of your lemons back but they'll take all your peanuts and then you get mad because they took all your peanuts and they'll give you one of your peanuts back but then the ta- they take all your apples and this game never ends and you constantly think you're winning because you got back a banana you got back a peanut you got back a you know no you, you're getting robbed they, they, just because they gave you a little bit back doesn't mean they didn't take more somewhere else. This is the, the Ronald Reagan argument I've had with so many conservatives. They'll say, oh, but Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, uh, in the late 70s, the economy was down the toilet. And Ronald Reagan fixed the economy and saved the union. And Ronald Reagan cut taxes. And, and, and you just start going through one after the other. He didn't cut taxes. He raised taxes like 11 times or something like that. Sure, it looked like he would cut taxes in one thing, but the overall was a net increase in taxes. And, oh, but he was going to, you know, he, he cut spending. He was going to kill two whole, uh, he was going to ki- uh, kill the Department of Education and one other, I can't remember what the other one was that he promised in his campaigns that he would eliminate. And he ended up funding both of them even more than they were when he went in. You know, it was like, you don't see this stuff? Yes, he talked a great talk, and he made you feel like he was shrinking government. He made you feel like he was giving back more of his of, of your taxes back to you. But in the long run, he, he expanded government. He made it bigger. He made he expanded the war on, on drugs. He, he enabled the, the DEA, gave them the kind of budget that they needed to explode like they did. And that's what they do, whether they're Democrat or Republican. They, they, they tease their target audience and make their target audience think, oh, yeah, Obama's going to do all these wonderful things. He's going to stop the wars, and he's going you know, to give everybody free health care. And in the end, they think, oh, see what a wonderful guy Obama was? He stopped the wars, and he gave us all free health care. He didn't do any of those things. <laughs> None of those things that he, he closed Gitmo. Yeah, didn't he? Didn't he close Gitmo? Well, he said he was going to. Yeah, but he never did. It's still there. It's doing exactly what it did before. But what about all the uh, all the 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 CIA black prisons that were all around the world that nobody knew about? He closed all of those down, right? No, he didn't close anything down. He expanded everything. He killed more people. He just that's what they do. They lie to their target audience and then they do the exact opposite opposite of what they say. You know, Drain the swamp. Yeah, oh, we should really believe he's going to do that because the first thing he does is appoint sex people <laughs> or, or, or uh, you know, one of the uh, – it leaves my mind now, the other ones that, that came in with him. But he essentially did the same thing that Obama was doing, the same thing Bush was doing, the same thing Clinton was doing, the same thing other Bush was doing, you know. And the, but there are – there's a small crowd that wants something so bad – that they believe it no matter the evidence and they think yeah you know he's we finally got somebody that's shaken up the insiders and scaring the elite you've got the elite that's who's running this who do you he's a new york billionaire come on what are you people thinking yeah twice over too because he lost all his money at one point and had to build it back <laughs> up again and was i it, love the ones who's, go ahead 
I'll, I'll be quick. I won't beat up uh, politicians forever, but I'll be real, real quick. I love the ones that say, you know, Trump's going to get Soros. Trump and Soros are best friends. He's actually vacationed at, at Soros's mansion. You know, they, 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 they're, they're family friends. They go together to see the Rothschilds. How, how can they be enemies? They're not enemies at all. They're buddies. They're, they're literally business partners. They, they actually have joint ventures in business that is highly documented. Yeah. <laughs> and it's well, and, and you don't have to feel bad about beating up on the politicians because I'm going to do it a little bit too here. Because uh, it's funny, you, you know. I mean, that I, that's all true, yes, and it is well documented. And you know, like you said, the, the thing is, despite the evidence, these people. And when you mentioned Reagan, that always roils me up because he, the Reaganites, are some of the worst. I mean, that was he was one of the hardest ones for for me to get my dad to understand that he was being duped. You know, like my dad now at this point is almost the, like, I don't think he calls himself one, but he's as close to being an anarchist as you could possibly be, like without actually, like with that, was still holding on some crazy hope for, for, for some uh, <laughs> far off system that never actually existed. But it, the Reagan thing, it took me a while to get through to him because so many people are just, it's like, and this is, you know, you talk about all the other stuff that's happened in the past and the historical, historical examples. I can understand people either being completely ignorant of it or at least, you know, it, be, it being, have been learned so long ago for them and the information being put out so much longer before that. So you could say, okay, well, there may be inaccuracies. Like, but we're talking only a few decades ago where all of us lived through. <laughs> and it's like, do you really not remember? And you can, at the click of a button, find this <laughs> stuff out. You know, like, yeah, you, you're talking about how, you know, the, the, the tax cuts and stuff. Like, that's always the thing. It's like, how could you possibly, like, all you have to do is go to any website that lists what go, what went down during during uh, each presidency. And it doesn't matter what bias they put on it. They all put the same numbers out there. And yeah. you can just see, like, when did the, when did the uh, spending explosion happen in the in the Amer in the American government, like when what it began with Reagan, he was the first one to bring the budget over uh, over a billion, right? I think, and uh, yeah. it, so it started. Where was it a trillion with him? The first trillion with him? I don't remember. I, what, whatever it I was, I can't even remember. He was he was the first one. It started under him. It's like this is again documented. How can you not? How can you not understand this? It was all smoke and mirrors. And yes, like you like you said, yeah. he he talked a great game. Of course, he talked a great game. He was an actor. The guy was a <laughs> B-list actor for decades before he became governor, and he was a hardcore Democrat his entire life, you know. And then his and buddy John Wayne, to, until his buddy uh, John Wayne shows up at his house and says, "You know, hey Gipper, you know, we need you to do something for us. We need you to play the role <laughs> of a lifetime, essentially." And he went out and did it. And yep. he had somebody like somebody writing writing stuff for him along the lines of like you know Carl Hess who had written for other presidents before. <laughs> and sure, if you have somebody who's an individualist anarchist writing your speeches for you, you can sound as free market as anybody you'll ever come across. But just look at the evidence, and specifically when it comes to Reagan and that whole thing. Like that's why when Trump got elected, and I saw all, a whole bunch of friends of mine, or at least former friends of mine now at this point jumping over and claiming that this was the one guy they could get behind because he was so anti-establishment <laughs> and all this stuff. It's like, I one of the first things I thought of, and I, like one of the first memes I made was just the simple stupid face of Trump, and, and it just said Reagan 2.0, like Homer Simpson, <laughs> because that's, that's the first thing I thought of. I'm like, dude, you got, it, this is Reagan all over again. Lifetime Democrat. Yep. Has, has, has already been quoted in the past like that quote gets dragged up every once in a while. I don't remember if it was on Donahue or Sally Just Just Jesse Raphael or one of those shows back in the 80s or 90s where he had a quote saying, if I ever decided to run for president, I'd run for as a Republican. Um, and I remember him saying, like that quote is not entirely accurate, but I remember the gist of it. And he did say something along those lines. And, you know, that's exactly what any of them would want to do. They just, you know, where am I going to put myself in power? Okay, I'll go over on this side because I can say a bunch of things that are going to make people think that I'm going to be on their side and they'll all go for it. 
And yep. you know, it's it it to me, it's just it's mirroring the Reagan thing, like almost identically. Because here we go again. Everybody's excited at the tax cuts. Oh yeah, wait till like the 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 other shoe drops and all the tariffs start rolling in and stuff to make <laughs> up for it. And let's also wait until the, at least the end of his first term to see how much higher spending is. Although I can almost guarantee now that every one of those people who are who are pulling for him right now that will still somehow inexplicably be pulling for him then will try to come up and say oh it's not his fault he inherited this it's like wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> i'm pretty sure i remember everybody getting mad at obama when he used those lines like are you guys like falling back into that trap again too like how is it that so many people just get like again i think it's just is it desperation i don't know <laughs> <laughs> they want to believe Back in the early 2000s, there was a meme that that went around pretty heavily that was a uh, a picture of a street light in sort of a foggy, dimly lit, uh, a bad uh, black and white picture of a, of a street light. And it kind of looked like a UFO, but you could tell it was a street light. And underneath it said, I want to believe. And it was making fun of people who believed in UFOs by saying, you know, if you want it bad enough, you can see the UFO, but it's still just a street light. And I think that's the thing with, with the, the myth of the state is that people want to believe so bad. They, wanna, they want this great man. They want this magical, you know, they want to see the, the, the evil uh, boogeyman beaten down and they want their hero to be lifted up. And they want this scenario to be real so bad that they, if, that, you know, if they wish hard enough and really, really wish hard this time, that maybe it'll come true. But they can't let their face slip. It's like, if I don't clap my hands, I know the fairy's going to die. Uh, what was the, what was the uh, uh, if you believe in, in fairies, clap your hands, the Disney thing? Oh, yeah. Um, I can't. Oh, Tinkerbell. Oh, yes. You know, we can't, we can't let Tinkerbell die. We have to clap our hands. And you have whole movie theaters full, full of little kids clapping their hands as hard as they can to keep because they don't want Tinkerbell to die. So, you know, so they'll clap their hands. And this was a real thing back in the days when that show first came out. And you're teaching your kids that their meaningless action in a theater will keep an animated creature alive in a movie that's already been written and filmed and already produced where they're not going to kill Tinkerbell <laughs> anyway. But, you know, that's, that's the kind of mythos that, that government is based on, that kind of uh, blind faith in the absolute absurd. And people just fall for it, you know? It's crazy. Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, I, I mean, I can understand the people who haven't come to these realizations at all yet st still falling for it. I mean, it, get, it gets harder for me to understand every day. <laughs> Although, like I said, <laughs> like I said earlier, I'm trying really hard to be more emp empathetic these days because I realize a lot of my tactics were abrasive, to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, after after stepping back from interacting with a lot of people for a while and thinking it over it's like all right i, I can still make an effort here and i guess i got to be a little nicer but it, it still <laughs> does because there's just so much information out there for people to easily obtain it just you have to ha have to have a desire to actually go look for it and uh, obviously be willing to take in a whole bunch of information that's definitely going to rock you or you know rock your understandings of the current world and yeah. you know just go into it with an open mind but it's it's the people within like our our circles who seemingly took this journey took all took a similar journey that we did at some point but now we're like running back and reverting to it just in the hopes like I, you know, the, the Trump phenomenon, I never really, I never saw that coming at all. I mean, for, I was one of the stupid people who really thought just Hillary had it sewn up anyway, so I never thought it was going to go anywhere. <laughs> but I never thought I would see this, the groundswell of people that I had been, become friends with and, and, and you know, like I said, shared what I believe shared a lot of ideals with. <laughs> over the past five five years or so all of a sudden just jump on this train and go oh no we still have hope we can still we can still use the system and even if they didn't actually vote for them like they're actively promoting that other people do so and that this is going to be a better situation and you just you know even if it was as simple as well you just can't let hillary in really has it really been much different than than if hillary had gotten in 
I mean, the attention may have been focused elsewhere, but people would still be getting bombed. Maybe new people would be getting bombed, but people would still be getting <laughs> bombed for no reason other than to promote the the U.S. empire and and main, and try to maintain and grow the U.S. empire. But like all of these things would still be happening, as yeah. far as I know. The Republicans still haven't managed to get Obamacare repealed like they claimed they were going to all those times. I even know I thought Trump said something about the individual mandate, but I don't even remember that actually being put into effect at all. <laughs> you know, and they're what what they're doing instead is when you, know, you were rattling off all the things earlier about you know what Trump claimed he was going to do or what any of these people claim they do. I, what's that? I think that's Hort, I think that's Horton's law, uh, Scott Horton's law. You know, whatever <laughs> whatever a president says he's going to do during the campaign, you could be damn sure that all the horrible things he claims he's going to do, he's going to do. All the good things he claims he's going to do ain't going to happen. <laughs> you could take that to the bank with every single one of them because it it happens over and over and over again. It's, uh, That's what I really like about Scott Horton. He his mind is sh so sharp that he is not he doesn't let the fog of war, um, so to speak, cause him to forget what was done in the past. You know whether it's read my lips, no new taxes, and then six months later, oh guess what? We're raising the taxes. It, you know it, it doesn't matter what the president lied about when he was running for office. It, it he's he's going to do the exact opposite once he gets in there. Well, when it when it comes to somebody like Scott, I I think at least it, it's probably because he maintains a has I and mean, has maintained a pretty singular focus over the past right. what fifteen plus years he's been at this, maybe even longer at this point. I don't even know. The guy's amazing, but he uh, he stays focused on what I, I've heard a number of his guests refer to it, and he's kind of you know said it as well too but kind of uh you know humbly but he uh, you know he's staying focused on the most important issue at all times because it really is you know there's all these different issues out there and you can everybody can have their own pet issues and what the you know what they prefer to focus on but this is the one you know the the the, the war stuff that that uh you know and the and the, the 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 actual story of what's going on with the foreign policy of the United States like that's probably the single great most important thing to focus on because that's really where you can see in real time the bullshit happening. Like if you yeah. actually focus on that, and, you know, and it can be it can be depressing and it can be uh, you know horrifying, and you may not want to you may not want to learn about a lot of these things. But I've come to because I, I started listening to him regularly about a year ago after he listened, after te me, people telling me for so long that I should be, and now I'm finally like, now I get it. It's like that's how you stay focused on how bad things are and how you it doesn't it literally doesn't matter who's in there. So so focusing any energy on trying to get a specific candidate elected. Is is a waste of your time. Just look at the just look at the results. You know, yeah. I mean, how many for for all of Trump's bluster about and I I mean I honestly believed it's on some level he was more anti-war than than Hillary, but he's still he's still a rah rah American guy, and he yeah. still wants to drop bombs on you know who he and I mean he's horrible. I mean I'm an idiot when it comes to foreign policy, but I'm a genius when when I'm when I'm looking next to that guy. <laughs> He literally knows absolutely nothing, which is just yeah. insane. But again, just yeah. further proof that doesn't matter who's in there, the same policy is going to get carried out because they're not like the pre the president is a, the, the president of the United States, in my opinion, is as close to a figurehead like the Queen of England at this point as it could possibly be with not actually being an admitted one. Because at least in England, they admit that the Queen is essentially is just a figurehead now. Uh, you know, yeah. we're almost at that level. <laughs> Yeah. Um, on back on Scott Horton, you know, Scott has done what what really all of us should do in the sense that he he has found a, a little corner where he is really good at that, and it's incredibly important. And he focuses all his attention like a laser, just right on that one thing, and he won't let himself get distracted by by other things. Like it it it's very difficult. Uh, you know, Scott's is a good anarchist, and he's he's a good in economics, and he's good in a lot of other areas, but he does not focus his his work on that. He focuses his work on.
anti-war and foreign policy because that's what he has a crisp understanding of. That's what he has a strength in, and he focuses himself on that one thing with all of his might. And I and I think you know I've beat up uh, verbally, not physically, but I've verbally beat up Walter Block a few times. Uh, he he's kind of a fun punching bag to to hammer on. <laughs> I do because <laughs> Walter Block will <laughs> Walter Block will take on things he knows nothing about and speak with great authority on them. And when Walter Block sticks with the things he knows, he is a straight-out genius. But he's a babbling old man when he gets off on other things. And you can say the same thing about Ben Stone. You know, you can say the same thing about Tom Woods. You can say the same about uh, almost any of these guys. As long as we focus on the thing that, that we do the best and we know the best, we're going to do really well in that. But when you allow yourself to get off on topics that you know that you don't really know what you're talking about, it it makes all of us look stupid, because we all kind of are are from the outside. People look in and they see Scott Horton, they see Tom Woods, they see the big names, and you know uh, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. They see these big names, and when they see some of these guys just absolutely making fools of themselves, they associate all of us together. And, and that's not fair, that's collectivism, but unfortunately that's how people do. But if we had more like Scott Horton that would only focus on the things that he knows about, then we'd have less of the foolishness off on the sides, uh, making us all look like a bunch of, bunch of goofy retards. Oops, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> oh, somebody, somebody just got triggered. That's all right. We'll get over it. <laughs> they may not. We will. <laughs> no, it's it's true though, and you know, it, it, you know, you're you're right. It is unfortunate that that while while it is like collectivism in a sense, it's you know, it, it, it's reality, and that's another point that I keep trying to hammer home with with people. You know, whether I'm talking to the people that uh, we've been discussing for for the past little while, you know, the the different people that still believe in the state or the ones who who claim to be anarchists but are still giving it one last try is that these ideas while and and i i I've, I've tried to find better ways to couch this because it comes off as like i'm attacking them as as a dumb communist although in a lot of instances i kind of am because it's like yeah you're, you're <laughs> basically your idea on paper is excellent but what's missing is you've left out reality you've left right. out the fact that most people don't think like us most mm -hmm. people don't see the world as somebody like you or i would because they haven't been they either haven't been exposed to these ideas or they have and they've they've shrugged them off or they've just but they've they've believed you know just like a lot of other things in their lives and a lot of other things in my life up until the point that i started paying more attention you know you just accept what you're told about it oh that's just all bs that's just fantasy that's just utopia you know you don't even have to pay attention to that don't waste your time with that type of thing whatever the reason that they don't they don't know these ideas it's it's just they 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 outnumber us <laughs> by a great great many so while you may have wonderful ideas and you may have and I, I've I've like I've talked to many people about this, you know, even ideas I may personally agree with. If you're not looking at the way the way the world is, like I said, I've been trying to find better ways to couch this because I recently went after somebody for say for saying something about about the way I was handling this, and I was just like, "Well, listen, man, you're you're not look like you have to realize that there is a world outside of mom's basement." And I've like I hate you because that used to get used against me all the time. And of course, I jokingly for the longest time when we did video back in the SOL days, pretend that I was in my mom's basement because my kitchen hasn't been updated <laughs> since the '70s, and I still have wood paneling in there. That's where I used to record from, you know. And I and I, I don't want to like I said earlier, I'm trying to be more empathetic to people, but that's for me. That's what it really comes down to. It's like, you no, know, you're you're just not see, like. Yeah, you can have all these great theories, and they may be they, they, in in a, you know in a vacuum in a perfect world. They may be uh, they they may sound, they may be great, but you have to get people there first. And if yeah. you're trying to deal with people, or if you're trying to integrate these ideas in the now, well, no, that's not the mindset you, you have to have. You have to have the mindset of, okay, I have to deal with things as they are, not like I would like them to be. 
And that's where I think a lot of people get hung up on a lot of these ideas. I mean, I've I've argued that's where I think a lot of the Bordertarians have come from. Uh, even even the people that are very hard, you know, the Hoppians and their and their. Uh, covenant communities and trying to do things yeah you know, try trying to do things on the local level like we were talking about earlier where you know i, I think it's actually in is it, is it in the end of democracy that failed i can't remember it's somewhere in his right hops writings you know the what should be done basically i think it's i think it's the end of somewhere near the end of democ- the god the democracy that failed but his plan of how to take over a town essentially and you know <laughs> take become the mayor and all this stuff and it's like okay again on paper, it sounds it sounds great, but you're leaving out reality. And for it's it's it was hard for me to say that for a while because for so long, like I said, that was an accusation that got leveled at me, and that was one that you you always find early on. People are just like, I live in the real world, you know, when they don't want to have an argument with you if you're trying to bring right. these ideas to them. And I just always said, okay, well, that's just ridiculous. You know, that's not that's not an you know, not an argument. <laughs> so, <laughs> but now I, I find myself saying it, but I. I actually thought it through and i'm like well yeah some of these people are right though <laughs> you're not taking reality into account unfortunately that's uh uh and i was in discussions with a couple other people on this exact same top a topic recently but this is kind of what jim jones if uh any anybody remembers jim jones um, that's kind of where he was at in San Francisco. The the whole idea, and I realize that's a big city and everything, but he had a lot of followers, and he had some powerful local connections politically, and they were in the process of essentially trying to take over local politics to make this perfect world that they wanted, and even with the power and the money and the influence that Jim Jones had, he couldn't do it. He couldn't beat the local machine of politics. And even in a small town, the local machine of politics is really big and powerful, even in the smallest town. And what was the result with Jim Jones? Well, of course, he gave up on it, and they just went to where they could form their own community. And unfortunately, the end of that was that they uh, had like 900 of them, 900 and some either were murdered or committed suicide. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not relating Hoppe to Jim Jones in the sense that I think he's going to lead people into the jungle to commit suicide. I'm not saying that. No, we save that. But what I'm saying. We save that connection for Adam Kokesh. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, the more uh, detached from reality, the more likely that kind of a scenario becomes. (laughs) But but still, you have the, 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 the workings there of where if he couldn't do it, uh, using socialist principles in a town that's almost entirely socialist. I mean, you, you know, he's already like if there was some town somewhere. Let's say, let's say we could pick, let's say Omaha, you know, or even a smaller town. I just picked that because it's right in the middle of the Midwest. Let's say Omaha is incredibly libertarian, and there's a large population of anarchists of of our type of anarchists living there. And let's say we could just flood Omaha and uh, start taking over local politics, we still wouldn't be able to because the local machine in politics is, and I've never, I've never talked to anybody about the, lo- the local politics of Omaha. So, so I'm speaking strictly in faith here. I know how the state is and I know how governments work and I can guarantee even having nothing, having no knowledge of Omaha, that the politics in Omaha are corrupt because <laughs> they are everywhere. But even if we could get you know, something like that, the local machine would fight us back and they would win. And if they couldn't win, then they would call upon their bigger cousins in the state above them. And if they had to, they would bring in the National Guard or they would do anything they needed to do, Waco, and they would burn us out or they would do anything that they have to do to win because that's what the state does. If we, if we think we're going to play the state's games with the state's rules, and maybe win at the game, then we don't understand our opponent. Our opponent will play the game right up to the moment that he doesn't, that he's not winning using the rules, and then he'll break the rules. And if you complain, he'll break you. That's how the government plays the game. So if we're going to play a game with, a, with an opponent that cheats, and you know this going into it, then why in the world would you play that game? If you're going to play basketball with, with, a, with a team that's bigger and stronger than you, and you know they cheat, why would you play them? 
why would you go out and play knowing they're going to cheat and knowing that they're that they're going to have the refs on their side? Because what are you going to do? You're going to you're going to take over Omaha and then when you fail, you're going to look to the courts to help you out. Who controls the courts? You know, what what law? Ross uh, Ross Ulbrich is not in jail for life for three lifetimes almost because they followed the law in sentencing him and in prosecuting him. Nothing about Ross's case followed the law. But yet he's got almost three life terms anyway, because they don't care about the law. When it all comes down, the real thing that they do is they oppress people, they put them in cages, they kill them if they have to, and they will burn your children if they need to, because that's what they did in Waco, and that's what they'll do again. There's, there's nothing that's changed about government from the days of Ruby Ridge and Waco to today. It's exactly the same. If anything, it's more powerful now. Oh, Absolutely. Not, and not only is it is, is it uh, more powerful, but some of the people that were around for that are still in the in the cover spread out yeah. throughout the government. You know, yeah, like that. That's another one of those situations. I was talking about the fact that the whole Reagan issue that people seem to be so blinded to is like wasn't that long ago. Well, now we're talking even you know even more recent. You know, move it up a decade and you have these type of instances. Like not only were these things documented at the time, but there's been extensive work done since. And I think there, there I believe there's a new documentary out right now on Waco because the anniversary just came through right and uh, I, th I, th I think there's something new out of it but again all, all this information is out there and people just nope we're going to keep trying although it does bring it you know to me that that does bring the of course the interesting question is like okay well if we can't try to play their games and, and win and even if sometimes we try to step out of their games once they find out we usually pretty much can't win. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> uh, and I, I think of this specifically because we just recorded uh, the other day, which well, actually that'll probably be out before this does, uh, but the, one of the last seeds Liberty podcasts uh, with Paul Gordon, and he was talking about what's going on. And I think it's, it, we were trying to figure out how to pronounce it. Uh, Rojava, Rojava, well, whatever it is where they, or, or, uh, where they actually have essentially an anarchist society being built and the only the only reason they're being left alone currently is because they've taken over the area and they're using terminology to uh, to 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 their quote unquote appointed leaders like they're using terminology that's understood uh, in the area to be like so like they think they they have like an actual working government going on but they really don't <laughs> <laughs> like and they've you know that's this is a story that it's kind of underreported but it's actually been going on for well over a year now and uh and they've they, you know they're they're working they're figuring out ways to work not necessarily within the the rules of the of the of the surrounding nation states but to get them to believe that they're working within the rules of the surrounding nation states <laughs> like is that our best option i don't know like what do you think about that because if we can't like what if you know we're sitting we've been sitting here this whole time saying political action is a dead end and we're we've given i think plenty of examples as to why <laughs> but you know and then you bring and then you bring up the case of ross which is a, a very obviously a very glaring one of you know, if you try to step outside of the state, they'll just create their own rules. Especially right. if, especially if you cre stepping outside of the state severely challenges the st with the state apparatus immediate, like in the in the present. Uh, you yeah. Know, so, what what are your thoughts? Like, what what, what can we do then, Ben? <laughs> I th I think with a situation like uh, what Paul Gordon was referring to there, um, I think. What will happen? I'll, I'll make my little. I'll, I'll be Nostradamus for a moment. Typically, what you see is that you get away with it right to the point of where conquering you becomes lucrative, and then they do. They conquer you. The, I'm thinking of the mountains of Afghanistan. You know, were were great for growing poppies and the little local groups. Uh, the the government in Kabul had no influence on them whatsoever they did what they wanted to do they lived their lives and pretty much the mountains of pack of uh, uh afghanistan did i say pakistan i'm in afghanistan anyway no, i think you said um, the afghanistan mountain, the first time <laughs> the mountains of afghanistan were peaceful back in the 60s it was kind of a trek that people would you know the sort of the uh, upper middle class to lower rich kids of college age would take a, a, a journey and they would fly to Kabul and then they would go basically hitchhike 
uh, to Kathmandu, if possible, if not just to Kashmir, and up through the mountains through Afghanistan, and you would just stay from you'd move from one little town to the other, and the people there would host you because it's in their religion. They they were required to by their religion. So you're a traveler, and even if you didn't speak very much of their language, they would host you in their home and then help you get to the next one. And so kids, you know, 19, 20, 22 year old kids would make this. Uh, almost like a, a Mecca-like journey from Kabul to um, Le- Led Zeppelin has a song about it, Kashmir. Yeah, Kashmir. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a regular thing that that you know upper class kids that could afford to be to do that kind of thing, and it's because that whole part of Afghanistan was essentially uh, anarchist. And even today, if you read um, James C. Scott's great book, uh, The Art of Not Being Governed. Um, there's still a lot of upland Southeast Asia that the state has not been able to penetrate where people live in anarchist communities completely untouched by the state. And nowadays they have cell phones, they wear, you know, Reebok sneakers, and they, but they just don't have a state. It's not working out so well in Papua New Guinea right now because the government there is going into the half of the island that was anarchist and basically slaughtering them. But but there's still parts of, of upland Southeast Asia where it's still working. But again, the moment that that something is produced there that is valuable to uh, to a government, uh, some empire, you know, it catches the reflection of, of of something gold catches the eye of the dragon. Then they'll swoop in and they'll take what they want. And if they want, they'll just bomb it out completely and blame it on you know whatever or. Or you know, or they'll just blatantly come in and take it. That's what they do, and that's what happened to you know Af- uh, the mountainous parts of Afghanistan. Uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, attempted to go in, and of course they utterly failed. Uh, and now the U.S. has spent how many years in there? Seventeen years or something like that. Yeah, I think we're at sixteen uh, plus. Attempting yeah. to hold. Yeah, attempting to hold the the uh, the mountains of Afghanistan. And they're not able to because, you know, Bill Bupert's law is a mountainous people with a rifle culture cannot be conquered by a uh, by an empire. And that brings us to this possible solution. Is it to create a stationary enclave that using anarchist market principles will be extremely successful both in providing freedom and in providing prosperity? through market principles, how long will that last until it becomes a shiny little coin that catches the dragon's eye and you can't move it? That was that was one of the things about the Seastead people. They, they had the concept that, well, we'll just keep moving. Um, the problem is aircraft carriers move too. So <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of bad. Yeah, but, but- you still, you still, you still, you still theoretically stand a better chance than somebody who's completely, you know, well, yeah, unless yeah, you're, they're... unless you're in the mountains. <laughs> and one of the concepts of the, of the seasteading is if you could break the thing apart, you know, if everybody had their own floating platform that you could break apart and move to different places, then it would be that much harder to, you know, round them all up, so to speak. Um, and it would be that much easier to get back together in small groups or large if you needed to. But I think in the long term, I think the, the beast as a whole on a worldwide basis has to, the, the market has to shift and people have to see government and, and see uh, how the state works all over the world. And there has to be a market uh, desire to get away from it. And I'm not sure that's going to happen until until statism gets so bad that people absolutely demand something better in the market on mass scale. And and you know, in the meantime, I think what we can do is we can just keep agitating the state as much as possible. Um, you know, playing on its weaknesses, uh, giving it the opportunity to fail whenever possible, and not being to blame when it does fail. So, but when, what, what I mean by that is, let's just say, for instance, that Ron Paul had gotten elected uh, one of the times that he ran, 
and right after that the economy took a plunge or right after that something bad happened a war terrorists something something bad happens then immediately all libertarians would have been blamed on ron paul's weak foreign policy or his uh, you know his weird economic policies or something something about whatever tragedy would have happened would have been blamed on all of us and and our crazy libertarian ideas um, and as long as we're associated with the state in people's minds, then, you know, then we're part of the problem when the problem happens. Um, I don't know if I've been explaining that in a right way, but if we can stay out of it the whole time and say, you know, that's that's what the problem is. Government is the problem. Politics is the problem. Um, the marriage between government and these giant corporations, that's the problem. And, and I'm not a part of that because I believe that that's evil. And, you know, I believe that that, that kind of aggression is bad. And the, the system I'm proposing doesn't have any of that aggression in it. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to use that aggression to make my system work. I'm saying there's no way a system can work based on this. And eventually people will see that. But then, but then I, I don't want to be taken as thinking that... Uh, you know, that I believe that there's going to be some libertarian majority at some point. There's not. We don't need a libertarian majority. All we need is enough people to see that the state is not the answer and the market will create the desire for freedom. I think if you go back to any point in time where uh, not only the government in the U.S., but I think it works with any other government, when a government gets so oppressive that the people just are forced to do something about it, that's the moment that anarchy, anarchy, true anarchy, can be sold to people much easier than when they're uh, comfortable and when things are going well. So, unfortunately, I think we need to do everything we can to make the mon the, the 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 beast as much of a monster as possible. Not not trying to get it to grow, but just agitating it so that people can see what it really is. And I don't think we can do that by getting pulled over in Texas for a couple ounces of pot. You know, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the way to do that is to engineer major malfunctions of the state. And that includes the news media. I, I made this comparison back with the CNN and their... Um, they're deadly AR-15, you know, add-ons that you can just clip a, a, a chainsaw onto an AR-15 and, man, you're really dangerous then. <laughs> um, you know, if we can feed uh, the media fake news and, and embarrass them for, you know, for the charlatans that they are, I think every time that the news media embarrasses itself like that, it's more important than some stoner getting arrested somewhere for a couple ounces of pot. And I think it's more important than getting some stoner elected to, you know, some county dog catcher or president of the United States or anything else. It's more important to show that the system is illegitimate and the system uh, doesn't function the way it's sold as. And uh, I, th I think that's a more effective way than you know, the trying to start our own little uh, cult in the desert or our own little enclave someplace in the jungle or try to stake out some area between two rivers and say, okay, well, this is the one place where, where liberty exists. And it will until it gets shiny and the, and, it's, and the dragon spots the little dot of gold down there and then he'll swoop in and take it. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, I, th I think you're right about that, unfortunately. It's just I, I keep coming back to that like it it's almost it almost puts me in like a catch twenty two situation I guess because on one hand I under I, I kind of under like I kind of understand and believe that that you know eventually once once it does become shiny enough but on the flip side I'm I'm always one to tell people and I I I honestly believe this and I I try to do it to the best of my ability is to is to just lead by example. You know, to, so you yeah. can show others that these things can be done. And unfortunately, that does involve crossing the state. You know, like when yeah. we, we started, we started this conversation way back on the on, the, on like the differences between like what what, what most people would understand is civil dis disobedience, and you gave the actual definition of it, which yeah shows that it's not <laughs> what most people think it is, and what I like to engage in called noncompliance, uh, where you're just like you have no intention of getting arrested, you want none of that. 
right uh, you know but like to do you to do you have to find a way to like kind of do these things without drawing attention to yourself but also be able to shine light on it to show other people because <laughs> like I, I mean i i do agree that i think the more people come to understand how vicious and 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 both vicious and inept at the same time the state can manage to be you know by yeah. by keep showing these examples over and over and over again like i do believe that has can have a greater impact although unfortunately uh, I, I on sometimes i think it can backfire because you a lot of people in certain situations like i know i did when it came to uh especially uh, cop shooting uh dog videos like you i can't watch them anymore and bec not because they keep freaking me like it's i had to stop watching them because i had almost become desensitized to them because i had seen so many of them and that freaked me right. out not that i was like right. so grossed out by because like, it was horrible I, I can't you know uh, same thing with a lot of the you know the police brutality videos like after a while like you've seen one you've seen them all and you've you've almost become just like desensitized to it I, I'm, I'm, I, fe I fear a lot of people will do that only because I, again, I, I look, just look back at the historical and even present day examples of how, how many people turn in, find out stuff like this. And instead of turn to action, turn to apathy. Yeah. Be, you know, so that, that worries me, but I, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm, I want to still try to find some way <laughs> to actually show this to people. So I guess, you know, based on what you were saying, I'm thinking, all right, yeah, if you still want to go out and try to create your own little community, if you want to secure a big bunch of land and have a have a little thing going, go for it. Just don't make it too shiny. Um, yeah, <laughs> but 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 make it make it uh, make it functional enough that you can show to other people. Because I don't know, I still believe that's one of the best ways. You know, because I could t I could talk about these ideas till I'm blue in the face, and I have in the past, and plenty of people have. We all can. But it's actually putting him into action, and especially when you're dealing with people, like you mentioned, you know, once people are looking for a better way, like once they're that fed up, yeah. But at that point, I think there already needs to be examples in place so that you can point to them instead of saying, well, oh, here's my idea. Now do you want to try this? Sure, they may be willing to jump on it right away just because they're looking for an out, but... There are, that to me that means they're also a lot they'd be also be a lot quicker to jump to another idea if it seemed better like they're just looking for anything they're not looking they're not looking for a, a, re, a good answer they're just looking for an answer which which may be benefit which may benefit them and you know the larger community in the short term I don't know so much about the long term though well this this takes us to uh, one of my I realize we're pushing it on time here so I won't I'll try not to drag this out too far but this takes me to one of my other uh, pet projects that that I think is so critical to our mission, and that is that, you know, the only way, like a resilient community of any kind or a, a whatever you might want to label it as, some, some small group somewhere that are trying to develop their own answer to the state by through example, the, the vast majority of times that those things go bad, it's because they have rallied around... A, a great man, a central leader that is an outlandish personality that that does questionable things, but his but his faithful loyal uh, followers always figure out a way to make an excuse for the oddities involved with this person. And now, and what I'm describing, it's it's going to sound like to some people, like I'm talking specifically about Kokesh because we've already been kind of throwing things at him, but that's a perfect example. You have an outlandish personality, uh, a very likable guy, a guy who's somewhat handsome, a guy who's a uh, very dynamic. I mean, there's, and, and there's all kinds of positive things you can say about Kokesh, but when you mix that with an isolated community, you end up with a cult leader. And especially, it seems, if there are control issues uh, and if that person has a tendency to uh, use strong arm tra tactics in some way to, uh, you know, to protect their reputation and so forth. And, of course, that's exactly what we saw with Kokesh attacking, I can't remember her name, T Tatina? Is that, is that oh, her Tati name? Oh, yeah. He, 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 Tatiana. Well, yeah, yeah there you go. He sent messages through his uh, enforcer after... Uh... Yeah. So, so the great, uh, the the great danger in a in a community like that is if they make the critical mistake 
of rallying behind a dynamic personality. If you, if you put this thing together in a way that no central dynamic personality and no central planner team can ha have ultimate control over it, I'm thinking, let's, let's say Bitcoin. The problem, I'm not, boy, I shouldn't have used Bitcoin as an example. <laughs> Let, let's, let's use, yeah, let's use a theoretical blockchain-based coin yeah. <laughs> where a central committee sort of takes over control of the thing and takes it in the direction they want. And the next thing you know, transactions are just horrible, slow, and, and transaction fees are ridiculous. Uh, and and the reason that this happens is because you have a small group of people that that are trying to centrally plan something but before that happened when it was when it was not centrally planned i mean the thing was just going like crazy and and it was uh extremely resilient it, it, it's just that the moment that it could be taken over by a small group of people it was taken over by a small group of people and the same thing can happen in in any other group like that where you've got either a, a single dynamic personality or a small group that can uh, work their way in because you're right back to creating a new state. If, if, if the thing that you're making is based around an individual's personality or a very small group of central planners, um, then what you think you're creating, you might think you're creating freedom, but what you're actually creating is just a mini state whether it's happening in New Hampshire or whether it's happening in the Arizona desert or whether it's happening, you know, in a jungle somewhere, it doesn't matter or in Eastern Europe, or it doesn't matter if it's based around one personality or, or a very small group, or if they can move in and take it over, then it's, of it's eventually going to fail. Whether, whether it fails by central planning failures or if it fails by an insane leader taking it into a, a crazy direction. However, uh, it's not going to make it. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. And I think that's good advice. If you're going to going to go start your thing. Don't try to be the king of it. Don't follow anybody else who wants to be either. <laughs> Bad news, man. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't care, I don't care what people want to, if people want to make that, you know, monarchy is better than democracy argument. Like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, nope. still, I'm, I'm still, I'm still not okay with starting one from the ground up. <laughs> I'm, I'm cool um, with that. Let me jump back to uh, uh, James C. Scott's book, The Art of Not Being Governed. In it, he describes a system that exists today to a certain extent, but, but in the past it existed far more widely in anarchical communities uh, in Southeast Asia. They would have what, was, what some people were, will refer to as the big man. And the big man is often either an, an old wise guy, an old wise person who is not a wise guy. I'm saying this to somebody in New York. I'm not, not a wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of wise but, guy. <laughs> but an elderly man or an elderly woman who is known to be very wise and have uh, you know, good thoughts and good leadership and, and be able to uh, uh, help in, in judging situations and settling differences. So, so there's nothing wrong with a community or a village or a tribe having somebody like that that they can fall back on for advice. But what James C. Scott described in there was that any time that the big man would become uh, too big, he would start gathering wealth to himself or gathering political power to himself, then they would just have a, a small group that would essentially draw straws and one or more of them would go kill him. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, that we should do that today with <laughs> Liberty leaders. That's not at all what I'm saying, but what I'm saying well, maybe is, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the old saying was, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Exactly. And that's, <laughs> That's a very, you know, it can be taken, like, like all Buddhist sayings, that can be taken in, in several metaphorical directions. But I, I think what it really means to me in my heart is that the minute that I start to raise up a human being into the position that no human being can actually be in, then I need to rip him apart in my mind and not follow him and not, not you know, detach myself from him and, and look and see, yeah, he does have warts, he does have flaws, he does make mistakes. And 
If we can do that with our liberty leaders and not let them draw us into a situation where we start to make excuses for their inappropriate activities and, you know, uh, I, I think we're a lot more likely to, to be resilient and, and not uh, be taken by these, by these obvious charlatans. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, no, exactly. And even even the not so obvious char- charlatans, or even the yeah. or even the ones who may not be charlatans, but are, and are earnest in their beliefs, but they still use you, you. If you follow them, you end up in the same place. So yeah, man, my advice. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, I think that's a, a great way to end this. And I'll just say that, uh, yeah, my advice is if you find yourself staring at a sacred cow, make sure you take a bite out of it. Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ben. This is uh, this has been great. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and having this conversation. This was a lot of fun, and uh, I hope I hope people got uh, got some uh, information out of it. Maybe uh, we uh, broke some delusions. That'd be great. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Uh, anything you want to say in closing before we get out of here? Anything you want to plug? Out hey, I just I just appreciate the opportunity to come on, and it's great to talk to you again. Everybody, get over to badquaker.com, download a free book that's there, uh, or download the audio version. Jeremy was one of the people kind enough to to help out with making the audio version of it. And I think it sounds pretty good um, and it's free. Yes. So why not? If there's an answer in that book or if, you know, if you can read the book and then go, yeah, but you know, it needs to be like this, write it, write that and republish the book, give it a new name. So, so nobody thinks you're stealing it from me and just redo the book and, and publish it yourself. Make money off of it. There you go. <laughs> Be a greedy capitalist on top of everything else. That, that, that's that's oh. what that's what people over too. <laughs> did I mention that it's at badquaker.com? Yes, you did. And I'll of course I'll, I'll of course put that in the sh- that'll be in the show notes along with uh, a direct link to the the Beyond Civil Disobedience series that we men- mentioned earlier because that's another one I think if you guys haven't listened if you guys haven't checked that out you should definitely uh, give that a listen because that's kind of I mean that's where the book kind of got its start right you kind of just expanded on that and. Uh, yeah, those, those, those ideas. So, yeah, you know, uh, on the front page there at badquaker.com, there is a link on the right hand side to an update. It's not an updated version of that. It's an edited version that takes out the commercials and some of the like the time related things like I was talking in, in there about, oh, we're on our way to Pork Fest and we're stopping in Pennsylvania. So I took out all that kind of stuff. So it just focuses on the topic. Oh, nice. So you might find it, it cuts out like you know, probably 15, 20 minutes of useless chatter by, uh, by getting the, the, the new versions that are there on the front page. Oh, well, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to go update my, the ones that are stored in my phone <laughs> and, and grab those ones instead. All right. Excellent. So yeah, like I said, all that stuff will be in the show notes. And, uh, once again, thanks Ben. And thank you everybody for listening. This has been Abolitionist Abstractions. All of my information can still currently be found at solpodcast.org. And we'll catch you next time. Peace. Oh, 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 oh,